Okay. <clears throat> so the, Sorry. Uh, uh, for our next talk, the uh, speaker is Nathan Gowens from Allen Institute of Brain Science. His talk's title is Cell Type Classification and Multimodal Correspondence in Mouse Visual Cortex. Please. All right. Uh, yeah, thank you uh, for the opportunity uh, to give this talk, even under kind of unusual um, circumstances. Um, so, <clears throat> yeah, I'm planning, uh, I'm going to be talking about a couple projects um, from the Allen Institute. Uh, uh, talking about our efforts in classifying cell types in mouse visual cortex based on uh, kind of alignment across different data modalities and collecting those data modalities from the same cells. Um, let's see, all right, so why are we interested in cell types? I mean, like Stephen mentioned in the previous talk, you know, there's no sort of universally agreed on uh, definition of cell types. Um, it can be a very, yeah, sort of not well-defined or, or slippery con uh, kind of concept. Um, but we still feel like it's an extremely useful um, abstraction for understanding neural circuits. So if you look at a given kind of neural circuit, like maybe a cortical column, um, if you don't have any sense of cell types, you really just have kind of a mass of cells and it's difficult to start sort of parcelate um, it out into any kind of meaningful um, structure. But if we start to investigate particular properties and group cells um, that are similar to each other, then we can kind of break down um, the different cellular populations um, give them meaningful names. Um, and having these kind of cell type labels really lets us integrate uh, information that we might collect from different types of experimental studies or communicate our results to other, uh, other scientists um, and really kind of establish a baseline for understanding what's going on in the circuit. So if we have that kind of description of um, cellular components, we can start to ask sort of more sophisticated questions like what is the architecture of connections in a given circuit um, or, or what um, circuit motifs might be present um, that could then underlie kind of interesting computations that that might be might be performed. So really the, the work I'm talking about is kind of laying this groundwork um, of identifying the different components uh, in the neural circuits in the mouse visual cortex. So historically, um, many of these kind of cell type investigations have relied on things like um, certainly morphology for, for many, many decades. Um, uh, intrinsic properties or functional properties. Um, but one avenue that has really taken off uh, in recent years is uh, using single cell transcriptomics uh, to develop these cell type taxonomies. So um, in single cell transcriptomics, um, a piece of tissue is taken and dissected and, and then triturated, uh, dissociated. So you have individual cells uh, from which you can isolate their RNA and then reverse transcribe and sequence um, to get a sense of what genes are being expressed uh, in a single cell. Um, so these are uh, the, the kind of advantages is that it can be really high throughput. So, you know, initial studies were in kind of the thousands, tens of thousands. It's been moving into the hundreds of thousands and even millions. Um, and then uh, it's also an extremely high dimensional. So you have, you know, the tens of thousands of genes that are in um, the, the mouse genome uh, as your uh, kind of um, features uh, space for, for this kind of uh, uh, classification. Um, and so you can do things like, you know, project those into two dimensions. This is a TSNE projection of the transcriptomic information. Um, and you can see that the different cells are, you know, kind of form these uh, different um, continents and then uh, smaller structures within those. Um, and those, uh, these groupings correspond to things we know about the cells, like, um, you know, whether they're GABAergic or glutamatergic or, or non-neuronal. Um, and then you can also see uh, kind of a finer scale uh, resolution uh, of the individual um, transcriptomic types or T-types as I'll probably inevitably refer to them as. Um, and um, these have, you know, different relations with each other where some are much more similar to each other, kind of like abutting each other in this two-dimensional visualization and others are much, uh, you know, on entirely separate continents and, and less related to each other. And so you can look at those different relationships and construct these uh, taxonomic trees, um, which also kind of reflect, um, uh, you know, are consistent with what we, what we think we know about the circuit anyway. So um, if you look at kind of this GABAergic arm of this uh, transcriptomic tree, um, you can see that some of the major branches correspond with like parbalbumin, somatostatin, VIP, LAMP5, which are major markers used to identify um, inhibitory uh, cells in uh, this uh, region of the brain. Um, on the glutamatergic side, um, those uh, major branches correspond to things like their laminar location, so which, you know, cortical layer they're in, and the projection pattern like, uh, you know, intratelsynthalic or um, pyramidal tract or, or near projecting corticothalamic, things like that. Um, 
But kind of below that level of resolution, we have sort of even more granularity um, than we have really dealt with in kind of other um, cell type studies uh, in the past. And, you know, there's like around 100 or so um, different types of uh, cortical neurons uh, from this study. And the question is, like, are they sort of real in a sense? Like, are they, um, uh, do they correspond with um, uh, specific properties uh, in other data modalities, like their intrinsic properties or morphology? Um, and how different are they uh, from each other? Um, and so that's kind of highlighted in this um, uh, figure um, from a review from Huang and Paul um, last year. Uh, this is actually taking that same GABAergic sort of branch uh, from the previous slide um, and trying to kind of assign particular types to, um, you know, sort of more well-known cell type labels um, um, from the, from the cort neocortex. Um, and in some cases, we actually do have a pretty good sense of what they are. So like this parvalbumin, Viper 2 class, um, through multiple evidence um, is, you know, pr we're pretty certain that these correspond to the chandelier cells, you know, these cells with their very unique uh, axonal arbors where they're innervating um, the uh, axon initial segment of excitatory cells. Um, in other cases, we're less sure, like they're sort of hypothesizing that maybe um, this pair of um, SST types um, corresponds with Marinati cells. Um, and in other cases, it's sort of a more specific question, like these LAMP5 LHX6, they say potentially could be neuroglioform cells like the others uh, in this subclass, or perhaps they uh, correspond with a, um, a deeper chandelier cell um, based more on the transcriptomic, or sorry, transcription factors um, that it's expressing. So. Um, so kind of in the, the face of this, um, we wanted to um, try to collect other information in a systematic kind of uh, relatively high throughput way, um, and then see if we could start to correspond um, other things about the cells with their transcriptomic identity. So, um, so this is the pipeline that we um, developed for this single cell characterization. Um, uh, in this first project that I'm gonna discuss, um, these are the two data modalities we're investigating. And, um, the idea is that uh, in the mouse, we can use um, transgenic lines to genetically label uh, neurons so that we have a sense of what their genetic identity is. And in fact, we're even using the same sets of, of transgenic lines used in the uh, single cell transcriptomic studies so we uh, can closely relate um, uh, those results with each other. And so um, this is in vitro characterization. So we're taking uh, slices of the mouse uh, visual cortex, um, targeting labeled cells, um, for patch clamp recording. And then during these patch clamp rec recordings, we're applying a very standardized electrophysiological stimulus uh, to these uh, cells to measure their intrinsic properties in a consistent way. Um, and applying you know, uh, the same kind of quality control um, criteria to everything. So we're not you know, excluding particular types of cells just because they look different than what we might expect. Um, and then we're also, uh, you know, with the same recording pipette, we're trying to fill those cells um, with biocytin, uh, and then we can process those cells, stain them, um, and then uh, reconstruct their three-dimensional morphologies based on high-resolution images, um, and then also align them to each other, you know, using things like DAPI to identify layer boundaries um, so that we can get a set of uh, quantitative morphological features uh, for comparison. Um, and then we're also um, using kind of the, the broader anatomy. So we, we have like these block face images of the, um, the mouse brain. Um, and we have our uh, uh, common, co sorry, common coordinate framework uh, that we can map the positions of the cells to. So we get a, uh, you know, we can make sure that we're in visual cortex and which layer and, and things like that. Okay. Um, so, uh, so first I'll talk about um, the kind of standardized um, electrophysiological analysis. So again, we kind of use a, a standard array of stimuli and then we take those responses and we try to align them um, for a systematic comparison across the entire data set. <clears throat> so in this case, um, we've taken uh, three milliseconds of a spike waveform, the first spike elicited by each of these three types of stimuli. So a short like, um, uh, like three millisecond current pulse, a longer one second long current pulse, and a slow, slowly increasing ramp stimulus. Um, and then just line those up with each other. Uh, and then we take those across like our entire, in this case, inhibitory cell um, population. So we've got this kind of cell by uh, EFIS time series uh, matrix. And then we apply a um, sparse um, principal components analysis uh, to those to get, um, to kind of highlight the particular parts that are varying across um, uh, this data set. And so then we can um, reduce the dimensionality of this, you know, several uh, hundred um, uh, number of feature 
data set into just a, a handful, uh, like half a dozen uh, individual features. And so then we can take other types of electrophysiological responses and apply the same uh, SPCA um, dimensionality reduction um, and collect those all together. Um, so we get things like, you know, the um, interspike interval shape, subthreshold features, um, kind of firing pattern features, um, the way that different spike features change kind of across a longer um, uh, current injection. <clears throat> and so we end up with a, you know, cell by about 50 sparse principal component uh, EFIS feature uh, data set, which we can then use for um, uh, like visualization, so projection into two dimensions, um, and for clustering, which we use a Gaussian mixture model for that. <clears throat> and so in this data set, we have about uh, 1,800 um, uh, individually recorded electrophysiology cells. And then from that, about 450 of those have uh, an associated morphology, which I'll talk about in a little bit. So again, so I, like I mentioned, we can take this, um, this matrix and project it into two dimensions. Um, so we, uh, <clears throat> and what we see is that it forms kind of um, these continents, maybe not quite as like uh, distinct as, as you might see with the transcriptomic study, um, but still quite informative. Um, and you see that kind of on the left side here, um, this major continent and kind of this smaller island are associated with spiny or, or excitatory cells. And then this kind of uh, set of four uh, islands or continents are associated with uh, inhibitory cells. And that's based on imaging them. So actually looking and seeing, do they have spines? Do they not have, do they not have spines? Um, we can also look to see which transgenic lines um, they were recorded from. And so you can see now that um, these major uh, inhibitory um, kind of continents are associated with particular classes of uh, GABAergic neurons. So there's, you know, parvalbumin, somatostatin, VIP, uh, NDNF, uh, which is similar to the LAMP5 labeling. Um, and then if you look at a more specific Cree line like this chat line, uh, you can see it kind of occupies a subset of the larger VIP space, uh, which is interesting. Um, and so, like I said, we, we can do this um, clustering analysis um, where we uh, end up identifying four different um, excited, uh, sorry, um, electrophysiological or E-types from the excitatory cells and then 13 different um, E-types from the inhibitory cells, uh, which you can see kind of characterized on the right, um, where uh, we can see that they have different like um, shapes of their um, individual action potentials, uh, different um, passive properties like their capacitance or input resistance, um, FI curves, and um, the uh, variability uh, in their firing. And so these, these are not, again, like necessarily the feature, these aren't really, directly the features that we used for the clustering. Those were the sparse uh, EFIS principal components that I talked about before, but you can also see that there are consistencies in these sort of more traditional measures uh, of their electrophysiological responses um, as well. And so you have like, you know, fast spiking cells, uh, regularly spiking cells, regular spiking cells, that sort of thing. Uh, okay, we can also look, like I said, at their um, morphologies and do a similar kind of unsupervised clustering uh, based on morphological features. Uh, and when we do that, we end up with 19 excitatory M-types and 19 inhibitory M-types. Um, the um, excitatory M-types often correspond with the layer that the cell bodies are located in. Um, and you see familiar things like, you know, these kind of uh, short um, layer 2-3 cells close to the peel surface. Um, a variety of kind of like um, tuftedness, so sort of non-tufted, more like star pyramid cells, um, regular tufted, uh, thick tufted cells, um, as well as other things you, um, that are known like the subplate cells or these um, uh, kind of interesting population of layer five cells with uh, relatively sparse tufts and, and long, uh, uh, but relatively few um, basal dendrites. And then on the inhibitory side, um, these types are, um, in, much, in a large part determined by kind of the shape of their axonal arbors. Um, sorry, I should mention on the left, these excitatory morphologies, we've only reconstructed the dendrites. We have not, because the, the um, axons generally project out of the volume and are not necessarily as well um, uh, kept intact in our slices. Um, but on, for the inhibitory cells, most of their axon is within the slice. Um, so we use that as the kind of major um, uh, feature. Um, so, and again, we can see some familiar things like kind of, um, you know, things projecting strongly to layer two, three, like Martinotti cells, um, chandelier cells with their very clear kind of axonal arbors, uh, basket cells, uh, bipolar cells, that sort of thing. Okay. Um, so, um, let's see. Uh, 
we're also, like I mentioned before, we're, we're interested not only in kind of characterizing these different properties, but in how well they correspond to each other, because we really think that a more robust definition of cell type is when you have cells that are varying uh, or, or, or consistent uh, among multiple different modalities. So, you know, things that have similar elect, uh, electrophysiological features and similar morphologies are kind of you think of as a um, sort of a more real or robust cell type than something that may be consistent in one way, but inconsistent in another way. Kind of like what Stephen was talking about before in terms of saying, well, things might have similar morphologies, but different connectivity patterns. And so then you might want to split those up into, into different cell types. Um, so what we did is we took kind of both sets of, of features. So our, you know, 50 so or some, um, electrophysiological features and our 40 some uh, morphological features um, and then use both of those together um, for clustering analysis. We actually did multiple clustering variants. We weighted them differently, the, the two data modalities. Um, and then we constructed this sort of like cell wise um, co-clustering matrix, uh, which we then um, used to define uh, consensus clusters um, across the data. So if, when we did that uh, for excitatory cells, um, we found 20 different types, and for inhibitory cells, we found 26 different uh, ME types, so morphological, electrophysiological types. Um, and then um, we also, like I, like I said before, these came almost entirely from uh, 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 transgenically labeled um, mice. Uh, so we have a sense of their uh, genetic identity. And like I said, these are the same transgenic lines used in transcriptomics. Um, so we can see, uh, do these um, ME types uh, come from uh, transgenic lines that label essentially the same uh, classes, uh, transcriptomic classes of cells? Uh, and we find that in fact they do. So we can, there's a, there's a very good correspondence uh, in terms of the consistency, basically like, you know, cells that come from transgenic lines that we know label layer two, three cells um, in from the, the transcriptomic data set, we find also label uh, a particular uh, ME type, this ME type excitatory seven uh, in our data set. And those in fact do correspond with cells that have a layer two, three kind of morphology and excitatory, uh, you know, kind of uh, um, phenotype and, and spines and things like that. Um, so, so this is kind of how we've organized these different uh, ME types. You can see, you know, a, a particular, uh, a single layer two, three types, several layer four, layer five types, um, again, corresponding with these kind of projection patterns. Um, and then on the uh, inhibitory side, several SST types, several parvalbumin types, LAMP5 uh, and VIP as well. Um, so that's, that's, um, uh, that's kind of, again, like this sort of um, support for the notion of uh, different modalities corresponding with each other. Not only do they correspond, are they consistent, these groups of cells we've identified um, with morphology and electrophysiology, but they also are consistent in the sense that they could come from the same uh, transcriptomic subclass. Um, one thing I didn't mention is that at the Allen Institute, we're um, very interested in making resources um, available for the broader scientific community. So all the data that I've talked about um, in this project are also made available publicly um, on our website um, in, as part of the cell types database. Um, so people can use them to do their own analyses or you know, investigate particular aspects of the data um, and things like that. Um, and so one thing kind of taking a slight uh, divergent for, us, for a couple slides um, that we've done with that data set is we've actually used it to build um, biophysical models uh, out of this data from the pipeline. Um, so I'll just talk about that for a, a couple slides. Um, so the, um, again, what we've got in our cell types database are these, um, you know, uh, cells where we know the transgenic line that labeled them. We have a morphology in many cases, um, and we have their electrophysiological responses to a variety of stimuli. Um, and what we've done um, is construct a kind of standardized um, systematic pipeline for producing uh, biophysical models from that type of data. So we can do things like calculate passive parameters. We estimate active parameters by using a genetic algorithm to match uh, electrophysiological features. Um, and then we find the best match of those parameters and contribute that to the database of models. And those are also made publicly available um, alongside the original experimental data. And so this is just kind of a figure illustrating that fit, fitting. So we start out with our um, trace from the actual experiment. We measure several uh, electrophysiological features that we're trying to match with our, um, with our model. 
Um, we actually separate those features into two stages. We find that that's sort of more consistent with our results. Um, and uh, you can see it kind of after that first stage, we've matched the general like firing rate and kind of general uh, spike size. Um, but there's particulars like this kind of doublet at the beginning <clears throat> that we don't yet match. And then we add additional features and run it for another you know, 500 generations. Um, and then we end up with something that matches the original trace better. Um, so we can do that across a variety of um, cell types as um, uh, identified by these transgenic lines. Um, so you can see the data is in black, the models in, in red. Uh, we can, this same algorithm fits a variety of kind of uh, firing patterns from, you know, fast spiking parvalbumin cells to, you know, regular spiking excitatory cells. Um, and uh, then we can also take those models and see how well they generalize to other stimuli that we've recorded from the same cell in, in the database. So here we've injected a, a noisy current and you can see the response uh, from the actual cell and then from the model. Um, and here we've injected the slow ramp current and you can see the model response in a similar way uh, as the original cell. Um, so this is kind of a library of, of models that we've generated um, that again, are made publicly available that uh, other people can use. And then we have taken those and used those as um, components of uh, large scale uh, network uh, circuit models, uh, which I don't have time to get into, but just wanted to, to mention. So um, there's this model, um, the first model that we published was a model of just the layer four um, cortical circuit. It's using kind of a handful of these um, types. So a couple of parvalbumin and a couple of excitatory types. Um, it's still a fairly large scale model. It kind of represents much of, uh, at least I think over half of uh, the mouse um, V1. Um, and that, that was published in PLOS Computational Biology. And then another uh, study that just came out, I think like a couple weeks ago, um, is a full cor uh, cortical column model. So not just layer four, but all the, all the layers um, using um, models um, from you know, multiple um, uh, inhibitory classes um, and multiple excitatory types in different layers. Um, and, uh, and yeah, look for that in uh, Neuron. Um, okay, um, so, uh, so what I've been talking about with the um, kind of single cell characterization, you know, I left off at the, where we saw consistency with these uh, transcriptomic subclasses, but, um, but what I said before is that we're really interested in kind of validating these individual transcriptomic types or T-types. Um, and our data um, from this kind of transgenic pipeline, or you know, this pipeline we're relying on transgenic lines for identity, um, is is limited. But we do have a couple opportunities to kind of look at types more specifically. And so, um, some of the transgenic lines that we used do label uh, relatively specific um, populations of cells, especially if you look at cells only in a particular layer or set of layers. So. If you look at um, this SLC17A8 iCree line uh, and look at the cells in layer five and layer six, um, this is from the transgenic data. And we, we know that it labels um, predominantly these two uh, T-types, which are a uh, layer five near projecting um, type of cell and then some uh, kind of handful of, of others. Um, and then if you look at uh, the data we've collected here, um, those cells from that same combination of transgenic line and layer um, predominantly label a single um, ME type, this excitatory eight type. Um, and if you look at their location in this electrophysiological based uh, uh, TSNE projection, um, those cells, especially the ones from this particular uh, ME type uh, are uh, very tightly um, clustered in one particular location of EFIS phase. So it seems like um, we could uh, infer that these um, related T-types would have this particular morphological and electrophysiological phenotype, and that, that's relatively consistent, um, that they're relatively homogeneous. Um, similar story with another line, this pink line, uh, again in layer five and layer six, this labels a layer six IT uh, type, um, predominantly, again, labels mostly a particular excitatory type and is found in a similar place in electrophysiology space. Um, uh, Again, we can try to do the same sort of thing on the uh, inhibitory side. In this case, um, the NDNF line in layer one labels kind of a handful of LAMP5 uh, T-types, which again have similar uh, consistent ME types and are found in a particular place um, in EFIS space. Interestingly, this is another um, a line. Uh, this is the uh, this labels that LHX6 line, which um, 
the, in that review, um, pose the question of, are these really deep neuroglioform cells or are these a deep type of um, chandelier cell? And we find that in electrophysiological space, they are nearby, but not overlap, not entirely overlapping with um, the neuroglioform cells from layer one. So they, they're on the same island uh, <clears throat> electrophysiologically wise. Um, so that suggests to us that they're not, uh, uh, they don't have the fast spiking uh, phenotype of a chandelier cell. Um, and also their morphologies for the you know, two that we have uh, look more like a neurocleiform cell than, than chandeliers. Um, but we can only do this kind of analysis in a handful of cases when we really have a, a, quite a specific uh, transgenic uh, label. Um, so we wanted to, to if we want to really validate kind of the whole suite <clears throat> of transcriptomic types identified by the, <clears throat> the larger scale studies, uh, we need a different method. Um, and so therefore, um, we uh, a few years ago added um, the patch seek um, method uh, to our pipeline. So again, we're doing electrophysiology in the same way as I described before. We're doing morphology in the same way as we described before. But now, at the end of the experiment, we um, extract the contents of the cell with our pipette, our recording pipette. We kind of slowly pull out of the cell, um, uh, applying pressure to pull it with. Um, in many cases, we try to kind of form a nucleated patch to get as much genetic information as we can. <clears throat> and then we take that individual cell and put it through the same RNA-seq um, uh, uh, method that we use um, for, the, uh, for the dissociated cells. Um, and then, you know, our data set is smaller um, with the, this patch-seq cell than um, in our ori uh, original um, fax data set, um, fax-based data set. Uh, so we use that as kind of a benchmark for um, labeling. So we, we identify marker genes from um, that uh, dissociated cell data set, and then apply um, uh, a mapping uh, algorithm to assign each cell uh, from our patch seq method uh, with a particular T type. And we also can get a sense of kind of the quality of that mapping. So we're only in general looking at cells that map with a high confidence uh, to a particular um, T type. And you can see kind of from this UMAP projection of transcriptomic data um, that, you know, the overall UMAP is not exactly the same because, you know, different data sets, different sampling, UMAP can produce different results with, you know, different seeds and stuff. But um, the, the kind of, um, you know, the, the types are similar and exhibit a simple, similar relationship with each other on both uh, of these plots. Um, and in this case, um, we've also kind of increased our throughput um, through some uh, different methods modification. So uh, here, uh, we now have uh, 3,700 cells uh, with electrophysiology and transcriptomics. Um, of that, about 350 of those, we've reconstructed their morphologies. Um, and here, uh, with this study that I'm about to talk about, we're focusing on the GABAergic interneurons. So these are all, um, yeah, all, all GABAergic cells. We haven't done um, this for excitatory cells yet. Okay, so again, uh, we can kind of characterize uh, these T-types um, in a similar way that we used in the, the uh, first um, uh, project I talked about. Um, but now we have the individual T-type labels. So here are showing uh, just three example cells from each of these T-types shown here. Um, again, kind of just representative responses to uh, the same type of electrophysiological stimuli. And you can see um, both the diversity of the responses kind of across the whole population from fast spiking to irregular spiking. Um, and, but you can also see within a given T-type, uh, there is uh, some degree of consistency uh, with those responses. Um, we can use the same sparse PCA methods that we used before uh, and, you know, reduce the size of the dimensionality of this data set projected into two dimensions uh, here using UMAP. Um, but again, this is an electrophysiology-based UMAP. This is not a transcriptomic UMAP. And we see kind of what we had inferred from transgenic lines before, but now we have a, a more robust uh, transcriptomic label for the cells. So we have, again, kind of a parbabian island, somatostatin island, VIP, LAMP5. And then we also have these other two smaller, uh, you know, with fewer types, um, uh, transcriptomic subclasses SNCG and SERPINF1, uh, which are closely related to VIP um, as well. Um, and then on this, um, I didn't show this before, but we can do things like look at um, sort of electrophysiological features on this two-dimensional projection to get a sense of like what these different cells are are doing um, electrophysiologically. So this is one of those sparse principal components that's derived from the, the action potential waveform um, where sort of uh, values in blue tend to have narrower action potentials, values in red have wider action potentials. We can see that corresponds kind of with this gradient from left to right uh, in transcriptomic identity. 
Um, this is another uh, principal component that corresponds more to the, the amount of uh, SAG in a subthreshold response due to uh, IH. Um, and here you can see it's a different pattern uh, where there's a couple sort of hotspots that do have significant SAG from IH um, in, in certain regions of this um, electrophysiological data set. Um, so then we can take this map and use it to visualize where the different uh, T-types land. Um, and so that, this is what we're showing here with this kind of small multiples plots, uh, different uh, T-types from different um, transcriptomic um, subclasses. Um, and I think there, there's sort of like two major messages from, from looking at these. For, well, for one, I guess you can get a sense of like what the actual electrophysiology properties are from their location um, in the data set. So you, you know that like these different T-types have, have wider uh, action potentials and, and little sag, for example. Um, but you can also see that in many cases, um, the, the colored dots are quite, uh, quite um, uh, clustered or, or kind of in a, um, in a consistent location um, in this electrophysiological plot. So it seems like these cells that have been defined by their transcriptomic identity also have a relatively consistent uh, electrophysiological phenotype. Um, and then also uh, you can see in some of these cases that, um, for example, if you look at these two HPSE uh, or HIPSI as I'll probably call them, um, uh, the HIPSI SEMA3C and HIPSI CBLN4, um, those have, again, consistent electrophysiological properties, but they're also found in a, in a consistent location um, to each other. Um, so, so the T-types are not necessarily um, distinct. Uh, in their electrophysiological properties, they can share same, the same location in the electrophysiology space. Okay. Um, another thing that we can do since we're recording um, from these cells in slices where we have a good visualization of uh, layers and things like that is we can um, get a more uh, detailed um, estimate of their uh, laminar distribution than we could just from the dissociated cells where we're trying to kind of micro dissect individual layers, but you don't have a good sense of any sublayer distribution. Um, and we see kind of interesting patterns. So uh, like in lamp five, we see many of those types are predominantly superficial in layer one um, with some extension down into deeper layers. Um, like LAMP5 LSP1 kind of extends more throughout the whole cortex and LAMP5 LHX6 is found in deeper layers. Uh, SNCG cells are often found kind of throughout um, cortex. Um, VIP kind of ex sort of exhibits sort of two major um, laminar patterns. So many of them are found um, predominantly in layer 2-3, um, but others are found uh, uh, kind of more uh, evenly distributed through from layer two, three down to layer six. Um, uh, SST has maybe kind of the most um, variety in terms of its laminar distribution. So um, a couple types uh, uh, innervate layer two, three, but predominantly this CALP2 PD LIM5 type. Um, uh, other cells tend to innervate maybe like the upper layer five versus lower layer five um, versus the layer five, layer six border. Um, so it, it and then in the parvalbumin cells, uh, it's almost more of like a tiling of the cortical depth where you have, you know, cells going from a superficial layer two, three down to, uh, you know, deeper, uh, deeper layer six. <clears throat> and then we also, like I said, have uh, morphological, morphological reconstructions for um, a couple hundred um, of these cells. And we can look at their, uh, the morphologies by T-types. And again, we see in general, um, pretty good um, consistency uh, within a T-type, although not, not necessarily in all cases. Um, what I'm showing here are five representative examples um, from each of the T-types. And then uh, in these other plots, I'm showing um, the, the distribution of somas uh, across the layers, um, the average uh, uh, dendrite depth profile, and then the average axonal depth profile. Um, and uh, you can see um, in many cases, again, kind of like what we just saw in the previous slide, there's a, there's a good consistency in terms of the somatic uh, laminar location. Um, there's also, uh, they exhibit sort of consistent axonal profiles in many cases um, that are different from each other. So you have a, an SST type here that uh, predominantly innervates layer two, three, but not really in layer one. Whereas this uh, SST type over here um, has its uh, dominant uh, axonal projection into, into layer one. Uh, whereas this one, you know, uh, innervates some layer one, but it, most of its axon is actually found around its soma in layer five. Um, we can kind of quantify that similarity uh, over here where we're um, just doing a simple measure of the, the correlation of this axonal profile of an individual cell uh, with the average of the other cells uh, from that same T-type. Uh, and you can see that many of the um, 
the t-types exhibit relatively high correlations with that t-type average, although there are some interesting exceptions like this uh, p valve relin itm2a um, where uh, there there's more heterogeneity within that t-type um, than in others and part of that reason is because this t-type sort of uh, extends over more layers um, than uh, uh, than some of the other uh, types okay so again um, uh, we are interested uh, so um, we are interested in not only uh, kind of characterizing these different properties, but in how well um, they correspond uh, with each other um, in a more quantitative way. And uh, since we do see a, a relatively good um, home, uh, consistency uh, in these types, just kind of uh, in the ways that I've showed you before, uh, we were wondering how well you can infer a transcriptomic identity if all you knew was the electrophysiology or morphology or, or both of those together. And so that's, so we trained a um, random forest classifier to try to predict transcriptomic identity from uh, the different um, uh, uh, properties in other modalities. Uh, so what I'm showing here first is uh, we're just trying to predict the, the transcriptomic subclass. So LAMP5, SNCG, VIP, SST, or parvalbumin um, uh, uh, using electrophysiological features. Um, and here we can do quite a good job. Um, our accuracy is like 94%. Um, uh, the, the main confusion is in SNCG, which I mentioned before is uh, kind of similar to um, VIP and actually has some, uh, is kind of on the border in our electrophysiology plot between uh, uh, VIP and, and SST. Um, but overall we do quite well. Um, if we try to predict individual types, however, um, our accuracy drops. So it's around like 57% using electrophysiological uh, features. Now, this is a much harder problem uh, for the classifier, right? There's like, you know, uh, 50 types or so uh, rather than just five um, classes. Um, but still, you can see that there are um, sort of uh, consistent errors that the classifier is making. So, um, and the reason for that is that, you know, a given T-type might have consistent properties, but those properties could be largely overlapping with another T-type. So those, the, just based on, just based on electrophysiology, you can't really distinguish um, those two T-types. Uh, we see a similar thing with morphology. Here we have uh, fewer cells um, to classify. Um, so the accuracy, um, uh, drops a bit. Um, but then if you use both electrophysiology and morpho morphology together for the same set of cells um, between these two, um, the, the accuracy goes, goes up again. But again, it's still not anywhere close to, you know, 100%. So it's not a reliable um, discrimination uh, between uh, these different t-types. Again, suggesting that different t-types have uh, sort of overlapping properties in electrophysiology and, and morphological uh, spaces. Um, so kind of um, uh, following that, we wanted to see if maybe there was a sense uh, if, sorry, um, that kind of raised a couple questions. So one is for these uh, T-types that have overlapping properties, are those also transcriptomically related? So if you think of that kind of tr uh, transcriptomic ta taxonomy tree um, that I showed earlier, <clears throat> do these uh, cells with um, similar Electrophysiology and morphological properties uh, uh, inhabit uh, kind of the same, you know, sub branch uh, of that uh, taxonomic tree. Um, and then also, um, are there cases where we can sort of you know, maybe group T types together or at least identify situations where there is kind of robust correspondence uh, between morphology, electrophysiology, and transcriptomics kind of across all, all three of these modalities? So to, to start, uh, doing that, um, we again did this unsupervised um, morphology electrophysiology uh, type of clustering um, that I that I mentioned in the, the earlier study, um, de novo on this new PatSeq data set, um, and I identified again a set of morph uh, of ME types, uh, and then we looked to see how they corresponded with the the T types um, that we also had uh, identified, um, and what you see is there is kind of um, as you might. Or, I don't know if you have necessarily predicted it, but um, we see this sort of rough correspondence um, between these two. So the, this matrix is sort of roughly diagonal, but not precisely diagonal. So there's definitely not a one-to-one -one correspondence, which is what we kind of figured based on the results of our um, uh, attempt at predicting T-type from, from the other features. Um, but it's not, you know, uh, all over the place either. It's definitely not a kind of dense uh, matrix between these two uh, different uh, uh, types. Um, and these are actually in order of the tree. So um, part of the reason for that is because we do in fact think that um, 
related uh, transcriptomic types do have similar um, ME properties. Um, so to try to get at that a little bit more um, uh, quantitatively, um, we took this matrix and then we performed a, a co-clustering um, to identify kind of sets of ME types that corresponded to sets of T types. Um, so that's what's shown with these boxes uh, in these different things. And we split it up apart by, um, by subclass here. Um, and uh, then we said, does a given T type, is a given T type sort of uh, consistent with that, uh, that co-cluster? So in the cases of, you know, SST chattel, um, it, almost all of the cells from SST chattel fall within um, this box uh, where it's either ME2 or ME23. Um, and uh, so that one is one where we would say is consistent with sort of a, a um, similar uh, morphological and electrophysiological phenotype. Whereas the next type here, uh, this SSD MME FAM 114A1, um, uh, over half of the cells uh, from that type are actually outside of uh, this um, box that it identified. So they fall into other, um, other uh, ME types that are shared with other T types. Um, but but not in a consistent way. So in that case, we would say that this actually is not a particularly robust uh, T-type. Maybe it represents sort of a transitional type between um, different um, populations of SST cells that do have more robust phenotypes. Uh, uh, yep, I'm almost done. Um, and then, um, so we can take those uh, co-clusters that we've identified and then look at to see whether or not they're transcriptomically similar to each other. Um, so here we're using a Jensen-Shannon uh, divergence as a measure of transcriptomic similarity. The lower values are more similar. Um, and so we can see in some cases, like, you know, this pair of SST types, they actually are quite similar to each other. So we keep those kind of, we've consolidated these into a MET type where we're joining these two T types and then, uh, uh, they have a consistent uh, ME phenotype as well. Um, in other cases, we find that they're more transcriptomically different from each other. So here's a PV type that is more different from the other four uh, in that co-cluster. So in that case, we would split it out and say that this PV type does have a consistent ME phenotype, um, which is actually similar to this other uh, group, but transcriptomically, we would want to keep those separated. Um, so I'm showing the results of that um, on this slide, uh, kind of a summary. Um, where uh, this is just looking at SST types. So we identify sort of nine robust MET types uh, using that procedure uh, from the SST um, uh, branch of the tree. Um, and you can see, again, the kind of variety of axonal phenotypes. So some innervating layer one, some uh, innervating more the region around their somas, uh, some sort of even having kind of a dominant layer four innervation, um, and a variety of uh, electrophysiological properties that uh, accompany those as well. So for example, this particular type also exhibits this sort of either like kind of burst or like or, or at least rapidly um, adapting um, uh, spiking in response to a, a current injection, different spike shapes, different uh, subthreshold features, things like that. And then the marker genes uh, that most reliably uh, label those uh, MET types. Um, so we're not necessarily, so you can see that there's not lines drawn between every single uh, T type and these MET types. Again, so in some cases, that's because like MME, uh, it was not uh, robust enough in terms of its ME phenotype. Uh, in other cases, it's just because we, we don't have uh, enough cells uh, to, to classify them, in, for example, in this section of the tree. Uh, we can do the same thing for parvalbumin. Um, uh, and so again, we can identify, for example, like the chandelier cells, uh, layer T3 basket cells, sort of deeper basket cells, um, and their electrophysiological phenotypes. Um, and then also, uh, so, so most of our morphologies actually are from SST and uh, parvalbumin to, to a lesser extent. So we have fewer um, morphologies at this point from VIP, SNCG, and LAMP5, so we can make sort of less uh, robust um, uh, identifications of MET types here. Um, but we still think uh, we see some interesting things like, you know, two of these VIP types have axon that mostly is kind of from layer two, three down to layer five. Uh, and another VIP type uh, extends, uh, doesn't sort of stop at layer, uh, at the layer one, layer two, three border and extends into there and also has somewhat different electrophysiology. So in conclusion, um, uh, we are finding uh, overall, we think pretty good correspondence between transcriptomic electrophysiological and morphological properties, certainly at the subclass level, and then in many cases also at the, the cell type level. Um, however, we also do see that many of these T-types have overlapping properties uh, in, these, in the modalities we examined. However, um, they may differ in other aspects, things we haven't measured, um, things like connectivity, 
um, functional responses, um, that sort of thing. So we we have this in vitro characterization of many of these GABAergic T-type components of mouse visual cortex. We can build network models that incorporate this kind of more detailed cell type information, which could be useful for explaining particular features. Um, and we're also excited to start combining this information with other uh, kind of systematic data sets, cell type related data sets, uh, such as detailed local connectivity measures coming from large volume electron microscopy or um, identification of uh, T-type uh, presence uh, in, in an intact tissue context uh, with multiplex fish, like high, these kind of high resolution uh, um, comprehensive surveys uh, of T-types that will allow us to develop uh, high resolution cell type circuit maps in the future. Uh, thank you. Oh, and uh, sorry, of course. Oh, dear. Uh, why did it look like that? All right. Uh, so, um, yeah, uh, this work is uh, done at the Allen Institute, which has team science as kind of one of our, our key values. Um, so it involves a very large uh, group of people. I'm not even showing all the names here. Um, so um, my manager is Anton Arkhipov. He leads a, a modeling team that did those network models uh, that, I, that I mentioned. Um, other project leads uh, for this work uh, were Stacy Sorensen, uh, Jim Berg, Gabe Murphy, and uh, Hong Kui Zeng is kind of the, the overall sort of uh, lead of this um, uh, part of the institute focused on uh, cell type characterization uh, in the mouse. Um, other people, uh, and then, yeah, many other uh, people contributed to uh, analysis and methods development, uh, transcriptomic analysis, uh, the EFIS core that made these, you know, 1800 recordings in the first study, 3700 recordings in the second, um, many more than that actually. Uh, uh, the team that uh, does the morphological reconstruction, uh, certainly we need a lot of technology and infrastructure to support this kind of pipeline uh, development, uh, management uh, and leadership, and then uh, other uh, sort of core teams that support all of the work that we do at the Institute. All right, uh, and uh, yeah, so here's a picture of the team. Uh, we also want to thank our founder, uh, Paul G. Allen, uh, for his vision, encouragement, and support. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions. Thanks. Thank you, Nathan. Um, right now, there are two, two uh, questions in Q&A sessions from uh, Shavika, Univers University of Freiburg. Um, can you, do you see the, the questions? Uh, yes, I do. Yep. Uh, you said Shavika? Yeah. Yep. Sorry, just moving things out of the way. Uh, yeah, so the first question is, uh, the, in the electrophysiological analysis, it was shown that uh, sparse PCA was applied for different calculations like PSTH, firing rates, et cetera. Uh, what is the feature whose dimensionality we're trying to reduce using SPCA? Yeah, so I went through that a little bit quickly, but basically, like the PSTH, um, or fire, like in firing rate is basically the same, um, we're looking at the response over the course of like a second of um, current injection. And so we divide that into uh, smaller bins, essentially looking at the instantaneous firing rate in each of those bins. Um, so that ends up being like a, um, you know, like a, let's say a 50 uh, point vector or something like that. And then we're also applying different stimulus strengths um, to that, uh, to the cell. And we concatenate all of those together uh, to form the vector that we're trying to reduce using SPCA. So we get a sense of both like what is the actual kind of like average firing rate during those steps, um, but also how does that firing rate change or how does the pattern of firing change like, you know, burst at the beginning and then, you know, reducing or irregularity or things like that uh, at different levels of current injection. So it's, that's the kind of larger vector that we're reducing uh, with, uh, with a sparse PCA. Um, and then PV, VIP, and SSD neurons can be identified on the basis of morphological characteristics. Is there any difference um, between, uh, observed between these interneuron types in electrophysiological analysis apart from cell type specific uh, connectivity? Uh, is there any difference in their spiking activity? Is the similar classification observed for pyramidal cells also? Yeah, so, um, so actually I would say that I think PV, VIP, and SSD neurons are actually more distinct in terms of electrophysiology uh, than uh, at least I would say PV and SST uh, than in uh, necessarily in their morphology. So in SST, you have kind of what have been often called like non-Martinati cells, which are sort of like just kind of, you know, they don't have a strong degree of polarity. They don't necessarily send axon up to, to layer one. And then in parvalvumin, you have basket cells. And those actually we, we uh, can sometimes confuse with each other uh, with our morphological uh, classifiers. Um, whereas uh, electrophysiologically, those can usually be pulled apart um, pretty consistently. Um, VIP are pretty consistent 
uh, morphologically, those tend to be more, uh, in electrophysiology, VIP and SSTs tend to be uh, more similar to each other, but again, we can usually uh, separate those two. That's why we have kind of those different islands in our electrophysiology uh, two-dimensional projections. Um, with pyramidal cells, um, there's much more similarity electrophysiologically. So, um, so like a couple can be pulled apart. So like thick tufted layer five cells are more electrophysiologically distinct and those can be pretty reliably separated. But many of the other, like the different IT cells in different layers are much more similar electrophysiologically. Um, okay, and then another question um, uh, from Sian Zhou uh, from Harvard um, for modeling uh, the layer four cortical circuit. Did you make any simplification for computational convenience with respect to single neuron biophysical properties and connectivity? Uh, yes, and actually in both the layer four and the full cortex column. Um, so these these biophysically uh, these biophysical models are sort of perisomatic models. So um, we're not. Uh, putting active properties uh, in the dendrites. Um, and that's, again, to kind of, um, that, that uh, greatly um, reduces the sort of computational uh, need uh, or, or, yeah, computational requirements uh, for, for simulating models of this scale. Um, though we know certainly that interesting things are going on in the dendrites. Um, and we've actually done um, uh, even simpler, uh, or like, I guess, more abstract models. Uh, so if you look at the, the uh, full cortex model paper, um, we have kind of side-by-side -side comparisons of, of a biophysical model and a uh, uh, generalized uh, leaky integrating fire model, point neuron model. Um, and you can see kind of the, in many cases, uh, the responses are quite similar, but in, there are some interesting aspects where they are different from each other. Um, and then in terms of the um, connectivity, um, I think the sim major simplification was probably not having um, like short-term dynamics, um, but uh, again, you can look uh, at those papers for, for more detail. Uh, let's see, okay, um, so Rihan Zhang, uh, how many genes do we need in order to classify cell subtypes? Uh, I understand the more genes we sequence, the better, but if we do multiplex fish, we're limited by the number of genes we can detect. Uh, do you think how many genes are, are ideal to preserve the majority of information? Um, some people believe biological discoveries are not usually in the principal components and selecting genes that are PCs may not be helpful. What do you think? Um, yeah, so a couple of different questions. Um, so uh, the, the more uh, kind of transcriptomic oriented studies, um, like, you know, purely transcriptomic studies um, have kind of looked at that question of how many genes. Um, I think, um, I can't remember the numbers off the top of my head um, for sure, but um, like I think in the, like if you end up with around like 40 or 50 genes, I think you end up with like an 80% classification accuracy of individual types. Um, uh, so um, yeah, and then it's sort of like asymptotically, you know, increasing accuracy as you continue to add more genes. Um, you can do, I think, even reasonably well with a panel of, you know, uh, like uh, 15 to 20 um, genes. Uh, it, it also, if you can sort of constrain your working space, so that's kind of looking at like all, all types, you know, all like GABAergic and glutamatergic together. If you can kind of focus in on an area of the transcriptomic space, like I just want to tell parvalbumin cells apart because I know that all the cells I'm going to be looking at are parvalbumin, then you can get away with uh, certainly fewer genes that are more on the scale of, uh, that are approachable by many of the, the MFISH um, techniques. Um, and then in terms of selecting genes that are PCs may not be helpful. So, I mean, actually none of the work I talked about is using uh, PCA with, with genes. Um, so we use PCA for electrophysiology for that kind of time series, you know, uh, dimensionality reduction. Um, but uh, yeah, so, I, and in fact, our, um, like our mapping and classification is basically done uh, with marker, like identifying marker genes. So differentially expressed genes rather than um, like doing uh, PCA on that, at least that I'm aware of, so. Uh, let's see. Uh, so Jerome Kaiser from TU Berlin says, as a theoretician in, interested in neural computation, I'm a bit overwhelmed by the complexity that you find in these beautiful data sets. What are fruitful ways of building interpretable functional models based on your high dimensional data sets? Um, 
that's a great question. Um, I think we're a little bit overwhelmed sometimes by the complexity too. I mean, I think the things that we're trying to do in terms of like identify sort of the robust MET types, which are maybe fewer in number than just the number of T types, um, is kind of one way of approaching that. Um, still maybe is too complex for, for certain types of models or theories, um, but maybe as we can use that kind of understanding of uh, components to, um, like I mentioned, sort of build up circuit models or, or things like that, or, or identify uh, connectional motifs, um, that'll be a way of sort of addressing what, what are the um, significant aspects that, that are most important to, to rep reproduce in a model. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any more questions? Um, I have a quick question, actually. Mm -hmm. um, what what time do you think is a good time to uh, combine uh, the information uh, here with the uh, recording f uh, in which um, visual inputs are provided to the mouse? Um, I think Saskia would be a very good oh, person okay. to yeah. probably talk about that sort of thing. Right. As she's so about to talk about uh, the yeah. types of responses you get when you. Uh, apply or uh, yeah, give mice visual stimuli. But I think we're, we're trying to move in that direction, absolutely. Uh, yeah, establish kind of tools. Um, you know, the, the, the way that we're identifying these um, cell types is in many cases genetically based. And so that offers uh, particular tools that we can use to kind of try to um, connect across different experimental approaches. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Nathan. <laughs>